what of Elon Musk's support of Donald Trump? Now, remember, he has money and he has a major social media empire. Uh, and apparently he's ready to go out on the stump and campaign for him. Difference that it makes? Well, you know, Mark, you, you before the clip, I thought you hit on something really important. To me, the greatest on on about Musk himself is does his voice, does his weight, does his visage, does that carry any weight? I mean, at this point for Musk, it's kind of a celebrity endorsement, right? That's that's what it is. And, and you know, everybody's trying to make sense out of, you know, does Taylor Swift's this endorsement, off? does that make any difference for Kamala Harris? I, I think more significant is the other part that you mentioned, and that is the money more specifically what he's targeted is what he just talked about there, the, what we call GOTV or get out the vote efforts. That is really where he is focused. And I think that's very interesting because that in as close an election as this is, and just to set the stage, we can say it in one sentence. Nothing has changed since we talked last Monday in the numbers, Mark. All seven battleground states within the margin of error. The national poll, again, for the most part, within the margin of error. So the get out to vote efforts, the registering people, the identifying who's likely to vote, and then ensuring that they do, that is going to be, I think, and most observers are now saying, the actual tipping point in this election in the next four weeks. And so if Musk becomes a major player there, it could make a difference. In that spirit, I want to talk about something that I saw this weekend, Reince Priebus. You know, I, I, some things that they do on that This Week show, I, I like. I think Stephanopoulos, this is sort of an aside, but I'll just finish my thought. I think he pushes back on some of the BS better than the other hosts who do these shows on, certainly on NBC and uh, on, on uh, CBS. Anyway, that said, one of the things I don't like is that he gets these partisans on. I mean, I guess that's the thing. They get the partisans on, so you hear the various partisan positions, but they're just, they go so extreme. So one of the partisans they have on, who I just can't stand, is this Rens Priebus. I'm sorry, that's just my personal feeling. But I'm still going to play you a clip from Rens Priebus and tell you uh, that I agree with something that Rens Priebus has said. So uh, with that lengthy preamble, uh, Tony, if you could get that up for me, please, the, um, the clip from uh, this week. Do you not have it? After you got it. Yeah, okay. Uh, this is a Priebus on this week, just uh, yesterday on ABC. What should worry Kamala Harris is the fact that in 2016, Trump was supposed to lose by four. He lost by two nationally. He was supposed to lose by eight and a half in 2020. He lost nationally by three or four. And right now he's only down by two and a half. That's just nationally. So the, the problem that Kamala Harris has is that when Trump was president, unemployment was low. Gas was cheap. Groceries were cheap. We didn't have wars. We had a secure border. So all of these scare tactics, Trump's a threat to democracy. It hasn't worked because the truth is people don't like where they're at in America. They don't like the state of the economy. She had three and a half years to do it and she didn't. Right. So her message is falling flat. So you can flat. stop that right us. there. First of all, there are two things that I would just say and then I'll let you speak, Gary. One is the right is doing that thing with Kamala Harris's name, and it really pisses me off. I, I, I get it. They do the same thing when they, when they say the Democrat Party, whatever. It's their, it's their little thing. It's a way to shiv Kamala Harris while you're basically making a point. He does it, and it's despicable, and somebody should call him out on it. Um, I have seen some right-wing forums where they do say, hey, her name is Kamala Harris, not Kamala Harris. But anyway, that, it, it's a small point. His broader point that I agree with is that I think Trump can be underestimated in these polls. I mean, he's undercounted essentially in every election of significance, right? The last couple of elections, he's been undercounted. And so I wanted to get your thought on that. Yeah, you know, that is something that right now in terms of the polling world is the great debate. Have we put the metrics together the right way this time to accurately reflect what's happening in the American public? And what's interesting about this, Mark, and it's important for people to know, you know, polling and the, and the pollsters will tell you themselves, it is an inexact science. There are all kinds of tweaks that are done to the raw data to try to approximate as best they can what they believe to be, for example, the likely turnout. But not just the likely turnout writ large, but for each individual demographic, you know, black men, young men, et cetera. So they're trying and, and you know, what's and what's the turnout for Republicans going to be versus Democrats versus independents. So all of that 
is thrown into the mix. And what, you know, Priebus is pointing out, a former chair of the National Republican Party pointing out, was that, yes, the pollsters admit they got that wrong in 2016, 2020, and undercounted the Trump vote as a result. And so there have been Democrats, as you're kind of making known here, Mark, even nationally known Democrats who are worried about this, that they haven't tweaked the numbers accurately this time. Well, we won't know. I mean, Nate Cohen of the New York Times said this yesterday. We won't know this until the election itself. But that they've, again, perhaps undercounted Trump's support. And with as close as things are now, that could. I mean, it sounds crazy. But in something like the battleground states, Nate Cohen points out if we got it wrong again, it could be a Trump landslide in the battleground states. It's wild to think that it's that Bradley effect, right? Isn't that uh, what was it was called, uh, Gary Dietrich, the uh, the reluctance to admit that you weren't going to vote for Bradley for governor? Was there, We've touched on that before, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Mark, that's really a, an astute historical comment. If people don't know, especially our national audience, Brad, Bradley was running for California governor as a black man, and he would have been the first black governor of California. And notably, uh, he was way behind in the polls, but he performed much better on Election Day. So what Mark's referring to was that and this is this was decades ago. OK, but people the, the assumption was, as the numbers were crunched after the election, that people were hesitant to say they were going to support Mayor Bradley, former mayor of L.A., for California's governor's race. So, Mark, I want to break this into two parts. There's two parts of what you're talking about now. One is, is there a Trump effect like a Bradley effect? Are people still, or maybe even more so, given the preamble you gave before I came on with you, you know, people so anti-Trump, or they're so fearful that their family, friends, coworkers, neighbors feel that way, that they're saying, well, you know, I'm not really sure, but boom, I'm going to vote for Trump, right? But they're not going to tell somebody. That's half of that potential error equation. The other half is, is the tweaking of the pollsters inaccurate? Is somehow the turnout model not right? Are Trump people going to turn out at a higher level than the Harris people are expected to turn out? Are the independents not going to cast their votes for Kamala, but go ahead and go with the Green Party or something else? So that's the real key. Those are the two factors that could significantly impact the polls. And as tight as it is, again, we literally, Mark, are probably not going to know until Election Day what the answer to those questions are. One of the places in which she, Kamala Harris, is polling so well and so far out in front of Trump that I think it's undeniable is with younger people. Now, the polling of younger people and the support of younger people in a poll is different than younger people going out and voting for Kamala Harris. I wonder if you could spend a second talking about the disparity between those two things, the support people say they have for Kamala Harris in a poll and then the actual getting off the couch or, you know, not going to the concert or whatever. I don't mean to stereotype younger people, but I'm just saying they don't have a great history of showing up at the polls. Yeah, that, that is an excellent point, Mark. And the, and the demographics that make the pollsters stay up at night and drink 10 cups of coffee before they read the morning news is exactly that. It's what we call low propensity or low turnout voters. Younger voters are certainly a big chunk of that, but also um, certain minority groups. For example, young male black voters, you know, uh, hard to gauge. Are they energized by this? And they're hard to sometimes th this is a challenge. There's two numbers that are difficult with those demographics. It's very simple. Are you actually polling them accurately? Are you you know, I mean, these people are not picking up the phone in a phone poll, right? Nobody 21 years old is answering their phone. Anybody who has a 21 year old knows this. OK, so they, they they're they're worried about the fact that they're not getting an accurate representation of their uh, choices, their preference going in. And then they're concerned about that as the pollsters. Are we getting an accurate representation of their turnout numbers? Let me show, throw one in interesting. Big, giant unknown in the next 28 days. Former President Barack Obama. OK, he's going to be out on the trail starting this week. Will he energize the youth vote? They are counting on that. They are counting on him reactivating that part of his coalition and getting these people energized and getting them to cast a ballot. You know, if he just bumps up that turnout of just that demographic by 5%, that could make a massive difference. Oh, that's such a great point. He's a political rock star, of course. There's another part of this voting thing that I think, uh, I hope it just falls into the quirky bizarro world, although I do think it falls into the category of things 
that could gum up the works, which is part of the GOP plan in my judgment. Uh, May Musk, who is Elon Musk's mom, she was part of this big push this weekend. Uh, Elon, we showed you, was on stage for Trump. He is giving not only his endorsement, but of course his money and all the and his social media platform is feeding a lot of stuff to support Trump, as we've already detailed. May Musk says, the Democrats have given us another option. She posted this on Twitter. The Democrats have given us another option. You don't have to register to vote. On election day, have 10 fake names, go to 10 polling booths and vote 10 times. That's 100 votes, and it's not illegal. Maybe we should work the system, too. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it is illegal. It's 10 times illegal. Yes. <laughs> uh, I'm wondering uh, to what extent sort of the madness about gumming up the works might actually have an effect on the outcome yeah. of this election. It's really remarkable to think about. I'm touched on this once maybe a couple of weeks ago, Mark, you have to go back to Chicago, Mayor Daley, you know, 1960, you know, dead people casting ballots and all this stuff. For this to be the level of issue, of course, it's become in the last election. Well, the last two election cycles in this one. Now, l let's be clear. You had it exactly right. That is illegal. Point made. OK, you can't just say, oh, yeah, Mickey Mouse me and Dumbo the elephant are all going to cast ballots today, right? Oh, okay, that's fine. Thanks. Here's your ballot. It doesn't work that way, okay? So let's make that clear. And that's true in any state. What people are more concerned about is states that have so-called same-day registration, which is you walk into a polling place, you don't have to register, you know, uh, two weeks or more in advance. You know, signatures can't be checked, yada, yada, yada. However, we, we have mentioned this before. Both parties are wise to shenanigans. There are going to be poll watchers. Uh, here's a technical term, up the wazoo, okay? <laughs> you know? And so I, I really too believe, I really honestly believe this, Mark, that the, that the you know, fake voting thing is way overblown because there's going to be attorneys, poll watchers that have been recruited by both parties making sure that some guy doesn't walk in, walk out, go to McDonald's, come in, cast another ballot. That's just not, in my view, that's far over blunt. Okay. So you may put this in the same category, although it was a pretty damning piece in ProPublica, an examination of a new election rule in Georgia passed by the state's Republican-controlled election board, suggesting that local officials in just a handful of rural counties could exclude enough votes to affect the outcome of the presidential race. Now, the rule was backed by national groups that are allied with Donald Trump, and it gives county boards the power to investigate irregularities and exclude entire precincts from the vote totals and from certification. Supporters of the rule, most of them are Republicans, say it's necessary to root out fraud, of course. Critics, most of them are Democrats, of course, say it can be used as a tool to disenfranchise select buckets of voters. Uh, apparently, and this is the last point, then I would love your impression. ProPublica did an analysis, and the counties wouldn't have to toss out many, Gary, to tip the election. Uh, many of these precincts that might be questionable. If it's as close as it was in 2020, for example, and Trump lost Georgia by less than 12,000 votes in 2020, as you know, uh, based on tallies from that year, an advantage of about 8,000 Democratic votes could be at risk in just 12 precincts in three counties under this new rule. There are 159 counties in Georgia. Tell me how threatening this kind of thing is to the legitimacy of the outcome. Well, I think it's concerning on one hand, not as concerning on another. So it's concerning that you would want to, you, you don't want to see any precinct any jurisdiction, any county elections board, any secretary of state attempt to manipulate outcomes in any place, right? We, we don't want that. I mean, I'd say most Americans don't want that anywhere, okay? That we need to say. The reality of it is that, you know, these results are going to have to be certified first at the local level, then at the state level, then, of course, they'll go to the national level. And at each one of those steps, Mark, there could be legal challenges. For example, let me just give you another kind of example. 
polling place opening and closing times, right? You hear this almost every election cycle that something went wrong in this, you know, this precinct. So we're going to keep the polls up until midnight here because of a weather problem or a technical problem. Well, that always gets people upset, right? Well, they're trying to gain the system, right? What ends up happening in those things? Those, those ballots, those precincts are put under a microscope. Attorneys flood into those precincts. Okay, what went wrong? Who's in charge? Let me see the ballots. That is going to happen with both sides. And I'll give you one other little factoid that comes out of SCOTUS today. There's a very interesting phenomenon that looks like it's happening, and that is the Supreme Court. Clear up at that level. is keeping most, most Supreme Court watchers believe their calendar relatively free this fall. Why? Because they know this stuff is coming. OK, they know that the legal challenges are going to start at the local level. Some of it will come to the state. Uh, almost certainly, Mark, some of this is going to end up on their desk. We'll see what happens. But my point is simply this. Nobody can unilaterally throw in or throw out votes and they have the last say, like a county elections board. They are going to be scrutinized. There could be legal challenges and they could be overridden. That's the bottom line. Interesting. Well, the Supreme Court uh, keeping their schedule open is certainly making me feel better because uh, if it goes to the Supreme Court, we know what happened last time. Everything worked out so well. Uh, so uh, is there anything in down ballot races that have sort of been eclipsed by a lot of these conversations around uh, J.D. Vance, around uh, yeah. Tim Walls, around, you know, et cetera, right. uh, you know, and then the top of ticket people that we yeah. should pay attention to that might have been lost in the smoke? Yeah, I think the most significant remark is the U.S. Senate. OK, uh, there, there's the Senate. Uh, people will know now uh, two vote majority for Democrats. Uh, right now, you can essentially count 50 50. Why? Because with Manchin stepping down in West Virginia, I mean, Democrats themselves are spending no money on that race. They know that's going to go. The Republicans ahead by way, way into double digits. So it's right now, I think you get effectively most most uh, political watchers, Mark, are seeing we're now at essentially what amounts to a 50-50 race going into this thing. But what's really interesting is, of course, everybody's focused on the Pennsylvania race, the Ohio race with Sherrod Brown, the Montana race with Tester. And those are really key, especially that Montana race. But what's interesting is the recent polls out of Florida and Texas, where Rick Scott in Florida is only ahead by low single digits and Ted Cruz. Some polls have him within the margin of error in his Senate race. And Democrats are actually making a play. Now, some people say it's nothing more than a head fake, which in politics we say, OK, go spend your $10 million. You're not going to get to use that in Montana. You know, Republicans said. But it's interesting. If they could just grab one of those, they could make it a 50-50 Senate or keep it that way, which could put potentially a Vice President Walls as the deciding vote as was a vice president Harris. That's wild. That's really wild. And boy, you know, Rick Scott, I, I'm amazed at the, he, Rick Scott, I believe was responsible for the greatest Medicare fraud in history. Okay. And he, uh, he's still, you know, right to the Senate. Uh, not, a, not an issue. I mean, it's, it's remarkable how voters look the other way on a, on a, on a lot of stuff. Um, hey, Mark, th there's one other thing I would like to just add in terms of turnout. Look at these the path of these hurricanes going through Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, right? I mean, there's a lot of people saying one of the biggest challenges in four weeks is having an election in a disaster zone, right? Because that creates challenges that nobody expected. And I think, you know, is really going to be something interesting to watch and important to watch to ensure that even those affected by the disaster, maybe they're not even at their home address anymore. How are they going to get to vote? Right. So that's going to be really key and something really interesting to watch. Yeah. And it's funny. Kim mentioned it as well. And they did have an election in this country. I'll remind everybody and you'll correct me if I'm wrong. But during the Civil War, didn't they? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, an election's never been called off, per se. So we've had it in all kinds of things. And of course, people point to COVID. I mean, that was a totally different kind of election. And people were worried then. Are, are people going to be disenfranchised for the most part? It's believed in an, anal an analysis post-election that most people who wanted to did get a chance to vote. And in fact, what has aided that is mail-in balloting and, of course, uh, you know, open polling places weeks before Election Day itself. Yeah, that's true. The, the broad time frame really has helped. I mean, I think that's 
where we have to evolve state to state, but you know, every state is different, as you always point out to us. These are uh, state-led efforts when it comes to elections. So, uh, Gary, so grateful for your input. And uh, looking at the weekend, it was one of those weekends. Oh, one, one last thing I just want to mention is, uh, um, I, and I always lead with my opinion, and then you can re, sort of reposition me to magnetic north if I'm, I'm, my opinion's wrong. <laughs> but, uh, you know, everybody's uh, breathing down Kamala Harris's neck about, you know, sitting down with the press, sitting down with the right press. In my judgment, uh, the MAGA land and GOP will always be critical of whoever she's sitting down with and however she sits down. So you're never going to win those people over. She is doing a 60-minute sit-down, I guess, and she's also going to go on Howard Stern. Um, so I'm wondering if uh, on some level that may um, either, A, expose Kamala Harris in some way that we uh, we didn't expect that might you know negatively affect her future, or if that's the sort of sit-down, these two forums and some of the others that she's spoken of in the next month that she's going to do, if that will ultimately accrue to her benefit and generally be a positive thing. What, what was your sense on the interview she's announced? The answer to both of those? Yes, to both. Okay. <laughs> they, they, are, they, are, they are absolute minefields. Come on, Mark. You're a, you're a really longstanding, sharp media guy. Anybody that goes on Howard Stern, you better be ready for some craziness. Okay. So who knows? You know, those are the kind of places that you have to be careful about, right? Because you can get led down a line of questioning or say, hey, well, don't you believe like that? You know, you have to be careful about that. Going on 60 Minutes, which was taped yesterday, you're going to run tonight. That, of course, the ultimate traditional forum. There too, though, if hard questions are asked that you don't respond to well in a mainstream sort of media parlance, people can knock you there too. But the, the important thing is that she's getting out there. That was a narrative that her people understood had to be put to rest. She's starting to do that more. She's being encouraged to do it more. And in fact, Walls is starting to do it. I think he's going to be on Jimmy Kimmel sometime this week, maybe even tonight. So, <laughs> well, so they're getting out there, and you know that that can only help as long as they don't trip up. Well, here's something from Randy who says uh, Walls's interview on Fox News Sunday wasn't very good, in my opinion. I don't think Walls did a very good job. Uh, I. I think that uh, something has happened here, too, regardless of, uh, well, yeah, it's true. Trump didn't, was supposed to do a 60 Minutes interview. Thank you. Liz says 45 chickened out of 60 Minutes, so he he ducked out of it. Um, I would say uh, one thing. The media in general and just the uh, political institution of media as a whole has given Trump a pass on the same thing that they're holding Kamala Harris's feet to the fire on, meaning... He goes on Fox, he'll go on Sean Hannity, he'll go on some of these places where he knows he's just going to get a rub down and he's not really going to get any kind of questions. I mean, my God, some of the questions on Fox, they're answering the questions as they question him. And all he has to do is say exactly and then, you know, fill in a couple of details. But he does a lot of that. And he also does other friendly ports of call along the, you know, political run. I don't see him doing anything anything in the way of interviews along the line, he just ducked out of 60 Minutes, as noted, uh, that would in any way expose him to the sorts of things that you're talking about, Gary, that Kamala Harris will be exposed to in these next couple of interviews. Yeah, what the Trump campaign will say in answer to that, Mark, and, and everybody has, you know, depending on where you sit is where your view is. They're going to say, look, we already did an ABC interview, right? <laughs> we, our, our VP did a CBS interview. I, we, I was on the CNN debate, Trump's going to say. So we could have done your guys, they'll say, and it's time for you guys to get out there and do that. I do think I, I, we haven't talked about this, so let me just really quickly take 15 seconds and say the two biggest landmines sitting out there this week are the response to the two big hurricanes, okay? Helene and, and Milton, that for any administration is a massive minefield. And so Kamala Harris's people know this, and what happens in the next seven to 10 days in terms of you know FEMA's response and the Biden-Harris administration's response could impact people's perception of her. And then of course, the anniversary today of October 7th, what happens in the Middle East? If Israel launches a very major attack, I mean, going after things like nuclear sites in Iran, you know, oil ports, things like that, that escalate things, that too could impact the election significantly. I didn't want to leave today without just mentioning those two. 
I'm so glad you did mention both. Uh, I was going to do a bit on October 7th as we kick off this next hour, but I also want to double back to the FEMA response because the FEMA response I spoke of to start the show, the idea somehow that there could be complete falsehoods around the FEMA response and government response perpetuated by Trump, by Vance, by by others, by Musk, by, by ever. This is the new... A talking point that's being circulated in right-wing media, that somehow money was taken from FEMA, given to migrants to put them in hotels, etc. I mean, it's it's really grotesque since the actual FEMA response has been very, very impressive. Well, the, the, the people don't know what that's about. FEMA has multiple funding streams, okay? The Department of Homeland Security has multiple pots of money. And what they said is, no, Yes, we gave money for migrant housing, but it's not in our disaster response fund. So that's that's what that's about. I won't go into more than that. People can dig into that. But th the minefield I'm simply pointing out, and it started way back when those images, some older people will remember when literally Bill Clinton and Al Gore were in a rowboat on the Mississippi River. And that's when this whole, and of course, and George Bush Sr. really suffered from this in Katrina. Uh, after that hurricane, but disaster response writ large is an absolute minefield. People want to know that you care, that you're you know, using every resource available and you have to really stay on top of those things. I mean, as best you possibly can, because that is something that people, you know, it's in the news 24 seven and will be for the next week. And so that, that's, I simply want to point out the import of that going forward. Of course, yeah, you're making a general point that's so very important. Yes, I was, and I was just simply saying that the specifics and and falsehoods that are being launched on top of that general point are 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 pretty grotesque. Uh, love having you on. Thank you. Look forward to next week, and uh, we're so grateful for your uh, your input and your uh, apolitical view on these things in a highly politicized environment. Gary Dietrich, of course, you can find him on iHeartRadio and also across the CBS Television Network stations. Thank you, Gary Dietrich. Also want to make the point that Gary's segment is sponsored by Bill Campbell at REMAX Gold. If you're relocating into or from Northern California, we have a lot of Northern California audience. You need a highly respected real estate professional to get you in or out of Northern California, and that professional is Bill Campbell. REMAX Gold, call or text Bill 530-448-448. 7474 530-448-7474. Bill Campbell at Remax Gold. Hi, it's Mark, and I thought that was great. Hit the notification bell. You'll know whenever there's a new video being dropped, and please subscribe to our channel to help us save the universe.